Perfect. <laughs> All right, now we are recording. This will be recorded, and then once it's processed, I post it to YouTube, and I share, um, I will share it in the groups, Piano Teacher Central, the Dorothy Taubman group, and the um, 88 group. So whichever group brought you here today, I will, you, you'll be able to discover the video. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for being here today. I hope that uh, this will be a beneficial session for you. I like to start each session just by talking a little bit about Dorothy Taubman and Sheila Page, who I've learned the Taubman approach from. So Dorothy Taubman uh, was truly this innovative woman who looked at, um, uh, well, pianist, of course, <laughs> but she looked at uh, these pianists who were coming to her with all these injuries and all these problems, and, and she then would look at people who were having successful performing careers and, and not being cut down by injury, and she started wondering, well, what's, what's the deal? What's, what's going, what are these people doing that's allowing them to perform without being injured, and what are these people doing that's causing them to be injured? And so she really started looking at and closely examining, um, I believe it's Thomas Mark who says, you know, that she didn't, she didn't come up with anything new, she just rec started recognizing what people were doing and putting it, in, putting it into words. Um, so we owe her a tremendous debt of, debt of gratitude, of course, for all her years of studying and working and learning. And then uh, more on a personal note, the woman who I studied with and um, still grab a lesson when I can, um, Sheila Page was a uh, pupil of Dorothy Taubman's and um, she founded her own seminar, the Keyboard Wellness Seminar, which uh, ran from, I believe, 2000 uh, up till 2017 was the last year we had a seminar. Um, and she really expanded on the work of Mrs. Taubman. Uh, she, has, she, she teaches a lot of Mrs. Taubman's principles and expounds upon a lot of them as well. So um, very, she has some very good work. Um, unfortunately, uh, none of it's really available to view. So um, I kind of took it upon myself to uh, kind of carry the mantle forward and do my best. One of my biggest goals is to help piano teachers understand this work in a context that is useful to your students. A lot of uh, people working with Taubman are working with high-level literature. They're either professors at universities or aspiring concert artists or college or conservatory students. And so I, I find oftentimes there's kind of lacking an element of um, practicality for piano teachers like you and I who are working with kids who are not likely to go on to do great things musically necessarily, but we can't really say that, and we can't say what they might decide in a matter of time that they might want to do, and so we want to give them a good, healthy technique to start so that whatever it is they choose to do with music for the rest of their life, they're able to do. So this is the third in a series of sessions. Um, on, on the Taubman approach, and uh, Alexander Technique has entered a couple times as well. We've talked so far about anatomical units, or more specifically the anatomical unit of the arm in terms of the bone structure and uh, some imp drawing some implications. This, this one's kind of gotten a little, a little messed up, but I'm not going to waste time readjusting it right now. Um, some implications, though, that can be drawn from the bone structure, and I'm just going to leave, this is, by the way, everyone, this is Bob the skeleton arm, so you can say hi to him, um, but I'm going to leave him there because we're going to talk about him in just a minute, but um, we've, just, we've talked about that. We've talked about the implications of the anatomy when it comes to sitting down at the piano, uh, and that was all in one lecture, and that is available on YouTube. Then after that, we approached, we started talking about this concept of arm weight, using arm weight in the keys. What exactly is arm weight? Where does it come from? And how is, the, what is the most efficient way to move it into the keys? And last time we talked about how rotation, rotating the forearm, is our fastest forearm motion of the four that we have. And so um, that that's really kind of the, the, the jumping point, and, and that's, that's our most efficient way of transferring weight from place to place. So I think that that kind of 
catches us up to speed uh, as to where we left off last time. And today we're going to be discussing the in and out, in towards keys and out away from keys, or uh, some people might prefer the vocabulary forward and backward. That works as well. Sometimes in, in, in the world of Taubman, for, forward and back have, have a different meaning. But the fact of the matter is the vocabulary is far less important than the meaning that you attach to it. So in and out might, might, might not be the one that works for you. Forward and backward works just fine. And of course, we'll be talking about up and down. Um, and there's not really uh, a, a, better, a better word for up and down than up and down. So that's kind of where we're at with that. So um, those, are, those are two of the four forearm motions that are available to us. So we have in and out. We have up and down, all right? The, the, that, that, that the up and down counts as one motion, in and out counts as one motion. We have rotation, and we have lateral arm motion, left and right. And we'll talk more about lateral arm motion next month along with combining all four of those motions in the concept that's known as forearm shaping. Um, and I'm going to do a couple different things with that uh, with that lecture. That'll be a very, hopefully, a very interesting and very useful lecture because we'll be talking about how we're taking now all of these motions and combining them and using the technique to create the sound that we want so that we can create the musical product that we want. So um, be sure to mark the, whatever the third Saturday of next month is. I uh, should have jotted it down, but I didn't. Uh, that'll be what we'll talk about next week. But anyways, our next month. Um, so let's just review a couple things here. First, we, we need to recognize that any motion that we make with the arm, with the fingers, the hand, the arm, they move as one unit, all right? So that's where our friend Bob comes into showing us what exactly does the arm include. And if you order, as I did, a, a skeletal model of the arm, You'll see that the arm includes everything from the tips of the fingers all the way back to the clavicle, which is a little hard to see, and the scapula, the shoulder blade. All right? So all of those things, it, this, this is not designed. It, it is designed with joints, of course, that are able to move independently. But as a whole, just as your car has parts that can move independently, but your car is not meant to have one wheel driving down the highway on its own. It's meant to move all together as a unit. Um, and that this philosophy extends to the body as well. But for right now, we'll, we'll talk about it in terms of the arm. So the fingers, the hands, and the arm move as one unit in what we call a coordinate technique, a coordinated technique, all right? So we wanna, we wanna keep that in mind. We've also established a principle, and we always call it a principle because the second you call something a rule, someone can come along and find an exception for it. So we call it a principle. But another principle that we've established is that sound is produced by dropping and releasing the weight, which comes from the upper arm, the humerus. Sorry, I wasn't done with you, Bob. I put you down too soon. Um, the humerus up here, this big bone, all right? That is the weight of the arm, all right? If you do this at home, if you just kind of let your arm go limp, and lift just the forearm part of your arm, all right? And it has some weight to it. It has enough weight in it certainly to make the weight, uh, or to make the key, the key go down. But then if you, and I'll turn a little bit to the side, if you lift under the elbow and lift that upper arm, you should feel a significant, uh, significantly greater amount of weight there. Um, so, so the weight of the arm comes from the upper arm. And that weight of the arm is borne down. And for this, I'm going to switch to a closer camera angle. And you'll have to forgive me. Sometimes when I plug my cameras in, they, oh, look at that. It came to the right one on the first try. You'll see here that the ulna, the pinky side bone, connects into the humerus. There's an act it actually hooks into there, all right? And that's the only bone connection. So this weight of the humerus, of the upper arm, is borne down through the ulna into every finger, even though you have two bones on in your, in your lower arm. You have your ulna and you have your radius. And the radius, this is palm up. When, the, when you go palm down, the radius turns over the ulna. 
And one of the things that allows the radius to do that is that it does not connect up into the upper arm. And again, I'm talking, talking strictly bone here. I'm not talking tissue or musculature or any of that stuff. I'm talking strictly bone. Um, so the humerus bears down that weight. So even though you have this kind of powerful looking bone of the radius on your thumb side of the hand, even when you're playing your thumb, the weight is bearing down through the ulna. All right? And I'm sure I'll need Bob again before we're through, but uh, we'll, we'll move on from that. So, um, so then last time we talked, a bit, uh, talked quite a bit about how, how we're dropping that arm weight, and we start with just a vertical drop, oftentimes with our students. And we just, we want them to feel not like they're dropping and flopping, so we don't want that. We want them to drop to balance points. And oftentimes when we're talking about dropping to balance points, moving to balance points, we make the comparison of walking. It's a lot like walking. So our students are picking up their feet and dropping their feet from balance point to balance point, and if they lose balance, they fall over. All right, so it's very important that students understand the concept not just of dropping their arm weight, but of balancing their arm weight on fingers that are rounded and supported. And we've talked about that as well, but that's basically just the natural curve that the fingers take on. We also, let's see, let me let someone in here. We also have talked about, uh, we also talked about last time that once we get them used to that sensation of picking up and dropping, that their most efficient means of transferring their weight from balance point to balance point is using forearm rotation. We say it's the most efficient because it's the fastest motion that the forearm has. So they learn to lift and release the weight of the arm to balance, from balance point to balance point using rotational motions. However, rotation, while it is fast, it's just not enough to get the job done. To say that our technique, when we have four forearm motions available to us, we have that rotation, we have that in and out, we have that up and down, we have that side to side. When we have all four of those and we say that a technique can run on rotation alone, it's much like saying that your car can run on gasoline alone. All right, and we know that that's simply not true. It needs oil, it needs transmission fluid, it needs brake fluid, it needs power steering fluid, it needs all these, all these different things to make it operate fully well. There's all kinds of different systems going on, and they all have their own function as well. And that's true of rotation, in and out, up and down, and side to side. Uh, each arm motion is important, and they do all happen to some degree between every two notes. So for example, and just a reminder to everyone to mute um, so that we don't get uh, your background noise in our, in our recording. All right, um, so to say that, let's see, oh yes, so every, every one of those motions needs to happen between each note, all right? So for example, and let me switch cameras again here so you can get a close up of this. All right, if I just play from C to D, all right, between that, I pick up to rotate and drop, so there's my rotation, but I'm also going to have a motion of my arm out. You see my arm is moving out. I could move it in if I wanted. I don't know why I necessarily would want to, but I could. If I was playing, about to play a C minor scale, I would want to, all right, so I can move my arm in. I can move my arm down, I can move my arm up, all right, so it's now, it's move, now it's rotating, it's moving out, and it's moving up, all right, and I'm going to show you this one from above, let's see if I can get the above camera, oh, look at that, two for two, all right, um, there's also a slight motion to the right, it's very slight, it's obviously not as noticeable as if I were to move my hand across like so, but it is, there is a motion every time you move across, one way or the other, left or right, there is a lateral motion of the arm in that direction. All right, so that is where we are at as far as principle. Now, I talked a moment ago about how each, uh, each of these motions is like a, like a system, and it, it has a different function. It has something different that it's trying to perform, all right? 
And uh, we'll talk a little bit about each, each one of these motions, but understand I'm talking in the context of, uh, well, I'm talking about context, I should say. All of those motions have to happen, but depending on what is happening, one of them may be more predominant than the other. So for example, rotation, it needs to happen everywhere. But there are some places where it's going to be a more effective motion than others. So some places where rotation is more useful, uh, or most useful, would be trills, would be Alberti bass, all right, figures like that. In and out is very big for scale type passages and repeated notes. So when you have a scale, and we'll talk, we're going to talk about this in greater detail in just a minute, but there's got to be more in and out motion than rotation, but rotation is still there. Um, up and down, alternating uh, is useful when you're alternating intervals and single notes uh, and two note slurs. So down, up. Uh, and if you do that motion, by the way, and we'll talk about the, that sort of thing that more next month, but that automatically gives you the sound, almost, that you want for a two-note slur without really any other consideration. You do have to, of course, have the ear attached to it. All right? And lateral motion, you'll notice, of course, um, and this is a, a, an overhead demonstration, and we'll talk more in depth about it next month, but lateral forearm motion, of course, when you have big leaps from side to side, and also things where you have uh, broken octaves. So moving across, uh, let's see, let's see if I can do it without looking at the camera. Ah. So that's more about left and right, although a lot of uh, m people would tend to think that that one's going to be more about rotation, that it's going to be more about, but when I do that, it, it feels very heavy, but if I think about the left and right, all right, it, it becomes a lot, a lot easier. So um, that's, that kind of is a summary or summarization of each motion in, in large picture what it's worth. Now we're going to uh, go into greater detail regarding in and out. So actually, one more thing about that, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to beat a dead horse with, with this, but um, I, I want you to understand when it comes to those motions, again, they all happen. In different, in different degrees. And one thing that I find very, a very useful example for illustrating to my students, a lot of them are interested in cooking and baking. And so I often will say, OK, well, imagine baking a loaf of bread versus baking a cake. Now, you're going to use salt in both. But if you put as much salt in the cake as you put in a loaf of bread, and that's not usually a huge difference, but you might go with sugar or something else, but you know, you're going to end up not having very good tasting cake. All right? And so they, that, that helps them see and understand context, all right? That um, every are there and they're important, but they aren't going to all happen in the same proportion every single time that they happen. So that's, that's, that's just a little note for that. All right, so now we get, to, we get down to the, the meat and potatoes of why we're here today. All right, uh, two factors that we want to consider when we're thinking of in and out. One is that we have fingers of different lengths. And of course, in a lot of traditional piano technique, and let's see, I'm going to, I think, go to a closer camera now. In a lot of traditional piano technique, we're taught, well, just pull the fingers in like this, and now they're all approximately the same length, so you don't have to worry about the difference of, of finger length. Well, when we pull our fingers in like this, we've discovered that tightens us up and makes it very hard to develop um, any sort of independence of fingers. Not that we want to isolate our fingers, but it makes it very hard to develop any sort of motion of the fingers to move freely. All right, so when we have longer fingers, our arms are going to tend to come further out, all right? Which might be counterintuitive, but really we're, we're thinking of getting our fingers, we're pulling our fingers out of the black key area. Unless, of course, they are trying to play on the black key area, then, then they'll be moving in. All right, another factor that we need to consider 
is black and white keys, all right? So the arm will be further in and up. We'll talk about the up a little bit later, but the arm will be further in and up for black keys and further out and down for white keys, all right? That's just, that's a, that's a principle. And again, I oftentimes have my students look at the keyboard and say, well, what can you tell me besides, of course, the obvious difference? What, what is different from a black key to a white key? And, you know, depending on the age of the student, <laughs> they, they get it quickly or not, but eventually they get to the point, oh yeah, it's shorter, you know, I, I accept that, it's shorter, it's further back in, um, and it's higher up. And again, I go to the walking analogy. If I have, if I'm going to walk up the stairs, everything has to come up. It's just, it's not just my feet that go up, it has to be my whole body, my head, my shoulders, my knees, my toes, all right? Everything goes up. And so they can understand that, all right? Now, one thing that's very important to understand is we're, we're talking about motions of the arm, all right? So in and out refers to the motion of the arm and not, at least not necessarily, the position of the fingers on the keys. Now, we move it in and out to accommodate the fingers on the keys, but for example, and I, I, I make a point of talking about this because for a long time, and probably just because of my own, uh, shall we say, thickness, <laughs> um, I, I, I was very much concerned with, well, if I play my thumb, if I play my thumb and I move out to my three, if my thumb is playing approximately in the middle portion of the, of the white key, at least before the black key area, then that means my thumb finger three has to come out and play here. And that's not, what, that's not what happens. What happens is that if I play my thumb here and I move my three out, or move my arm out, my three does come out, but it's still playing in on the key of where, of where my thumb played. So my arm moved out, all right? Which feels, again, depending on context, which feels better than moving into three. It, it all depends, of course, on what you need to do. And that brings me to my next point, that, that long fingers are not always going to necessarily be out, nor are your short fingers necessarily always going to be in. There's a prime example. If I'm going from D to F sharp, I'm probably going to go in and up to my third finger. If I'm going from D to F, I'm probably going to go uh, out and actually out and up rather than out. I could go out and down, and that's a little hard to see in the overhead. This is where I need to hire an assistant to switch all my cameras for me. All right, so I can go out and down like that, but probably I'm going to go out and up, all right? Um, another thing to keep in mind as we talk about these things, I'm going to demonstrate them as, as very large motions, and then I'm going to demonstrate them as motion, as the actual size of the motion. Uh, I, don't, I don't teach scaling down of the size of the motion. In other words, I don't, I don't uh, teach the traditional Taubman approach of minimization. I don't, I don't say, okay, let's start really big and then make it slightly smaller and then slightly smaller and slightly smaller until you get it just right. I teach, I believe in teaching the motion. Now sometimes I think it is necessary to start by teaching students a big version of the motion, all right? But to my mind, that motion is not the motion that I, that I want my student to learn. It's like a cartoon or a caricature of that motion, all right? So if I'm teaching rotation and I have, and I have a student doing this, all right, they are not, and that was terrible sound by the way, um, I, I, do not, I, do, I, I don't want them to learn that as the motion and then say, okay, now we're gonna make that smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, I say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna just start getting the arm to turn rotationally, all right? And in that degree, it's the same. But very quickly, as quickly as I can, I have them rotating like that. That was rotated, all right? So I'm going to demonstrate, um, I'm going to demonstrate first using some scales and then using some repertoire. Um, so we'll, we'll start with a C major pentascale, all right? And a lot of people are going to think that a C major pentascale is going to be all in and out. So in, like that sort of thing. All right? And that is actually not the case. 
And I'll show you a couple different angles here, but I'm going to show you first here. And you'll notice, so in again is the arm moving in towards the keys and out is out away from the keys. All right. So if I start on C, C is a short finger. And I'll, I'll show you in the overhead camera in a moment, but it's on the edge of the key. Now I'm going to pick up and move to my two rotationally, but on that rotation, I'm also going to move out. So I hope you saw my arm just moved out. And then I'm going to move out again. Now, if I move out again on my four, I run into trouble because my five needs to play here, well, or at least here, and it's hanging out here. So I have to lunge forward for that. So instead, I'm going to come out to three, then I'm going to start going back in on four. All right, so again, I'm showing, I'm showing this very large. All right, it's, it's hard to do it even that speed and the size that I'm doing it. All right, and now let me just show you above so that you can see what it looks like from above. So now you can see, you can see that my thumb here is, I'm playing it on the edge of the key, all right? And I move out, out, in, in, out, out, in, in. Now, in, in speed, all right, it's a very tiny motion, almost imperceptible, all right? But it's happening there, and this is what it looks like if I just rotate. And it just doesn't, it doesn't feel as good and it doesn't sound as good, but if I get, if I get that motion of the arm, then there we are, all right? So it's, your, your, your thumb starts here, I call it an in, simply because it's in for the thumb. Out, out, in, in, out, out, in, in. All right. Then, let's see. We'll move on and we'll do a D major pentascale. And we'll do the D major pentascale because it, its layout is slightly different than that of the C major pentascale. Of course, we know that because we, we have uh, different, <laughs> well, we have different orientation of black and white keys. All right, so for C major, we went in, out, out. If we do that for D, I'm playing three right here on the edge of the black key. And I can play three on the edge of the black key, but that out makes me feel very unbalanced. So instead, I'm going to go, I'm going to play D, and I'm going to be out slightly, in, out, out, in, in, out, out. All right, so now I'm thinking the D, the, and here's, here's, here's why I say it. it's, it's not about where the finger plays on the key because my thumb on D is playing in exactly the same place that my thumb was on C. But now I'm thinking of my thumb as being out, thinking of my arm rather as being out. You know, rather than thinking of that E as being out, think of it as just kind of stay in, out, out, in, in, out, out. All right, and then what that looks like from above. So again, you can see my thumb is starting on pretty much the same place that it was starting for C major. Stay, in, out, out. All right, and without any in or out, just rotating. All right. It sounds very busy, it looks very busy, it feels very busy, all right? So I'm going to put that rotation now and combine it with in and out. And now my arm feels a lot better. Um, on that note, I'm going to pause before we move on to, move on from the baby scales to the big, the big kid scales. Um, I do want to make this point of, of, of when we're combining motions, when we're combining rotation with any of the other motions, that motion should happen on the downswing of the rotation. In other words, if I'm going out to a note, I don't want to pick up and pull out. I want to pick up, and then as I drop, my arm comes out. As I drop, my arm goes in. As I drop, it goes out, out. All right, so it's all, all other motion, all in, out, up, down, left, right motion, happens on the downswing, the drop of the rotation, not on the pickup. 
if you're going to the right, you don't want to rotate, stretch out, and drop. You pick up, and then as you drop, you go down there. Uh, yes, there is a little up and down in addition to the in and up, and we'll talk about that in, um, in greater detail um, in, in just a minute, but yes. Um, and, and, and it really, the, the in, the out, the up, the down, they, they don't, and that's why I'm talking about them together, they don't really get to happen independently of one another. For example, if I, it, it, and, and I'm, I'm kind of doing it, I guess, naturally at this point, but if I just do the in and out without the up and the down, here's what it looks like and sounds like. So, well, I'm going to do it slow first. So I'll do D major again. So this is just my in and out without any up or down. Uh, let's see, I mixed, I mixed it up. All right, it just it doesn't it doesn't work very well. All right, because I feel very pressed down here, so so that up and down uh, should happen as as an occurrence of that. Um, let's see, let's talk about the C major scale. Um, so on this one again, you're going to start in on it, and this again might be one of those instances where instead of actively thinking out to the two, you more think of it, I think the arm does slightly move, but at least think of staying there. You don't want to go in, you don't want to go out. But unlike the pentascale, we aren't going to go out to three, because if I go out to three, and let's see this from above, if I come out to three, my thumb needs to be right here in a minute, <laughs> all right? And it's way out here. Even if I come out slightly to three, it's still puts my thumb not where it should be. So I'm going to come out a bit, and then I'm going to go in. So I'm in, and you can see my thumb is right there on the edge of the key, and that's fine. It can balance there. And then I'm going to pick up and rotate across. All right? So I have, and I didn't finish my ins and outs. So I have, I'm thinking of this as in, stay, in, in, out, out, in, and depending on if we're doing multiple octaves or if we're doing one octave, you still want to be directed in, in, out, or stay, in, in, out, out, in, in, then out, out, in, 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 out, out, or sorry, out, in, in, out, out, in, in, <laughs> out, in. All right. So um, I have some of that written out and some of it not. So I'm kind of I'm I'm doing it as I, it's, it's it's one of those things where you have to think it you have to think it out the first the first while that you're getting used to doing it, and then you then you kind of start to do it. So in speed, hopefully. Let's see. Let's see if we can do this. All right, so you have, this, you have this, this shape that takes place, and you don't want it to be too big. That's way too big right there, even. There, see, it almost happened. I started to turn around automatically at the top of the scale because the motion was just the right size. So it's almost imperceptible. Sometimes you get a bit of a bigger motion at the end because all of a sudden your, um, your momentum is coming to a, to a stop, and so you, you get a little bit, you see a little bit more of the, of the motion, you know, and you, you lift forward or roll forward or whatever, um, but um, that gives you a little bit of that. All right, then let's talk, um, let's talk about in and out in regards to, each, each scale has its own layout, and sometimes the, the construction is the same, and sometimes the construction is different. So let's talk now a little bit about the B major scale. So now again, I'm starting with my thumb, and I'm starting on the exact same place. I should have kept it on the overhead camera, but I'm starting here on the edge of the key. So, but now I'm thinking of that as being out instead of in. And so now I'm going to think in, in, all right? If I was playing a B major five finger pattern or pentascale, I think out, and then in, in. But because I'm about to play scale and I'm about to move my thumb over, I'm going to move in. And as Melissa pointed out, I'm also moving up. If I don't move up, I feel very restricted. And then I move across. And then 
out, in, in, out, in, 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 out, out, in, or out, in, in, sorry. All right, so you have that, um, you have that motion, and I'll show you again from above. So you have out, in, in, out, in, 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 out, in, in, out, in, 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 out. Then in, 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 out, in, in, out. So that thumb is out, in, 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 out, in, in, out. All right, so that, that gives you a lot more mobility there. All right, and that's, that's, a pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty much about what you can see with in and out You kind of have to look at the context of where you're playing and determine, you know, what, what's the layout of black and white keys and what's the layout of the fingers that are going to be on those keys. And then that kind of helps you determine whether you need to be moving in or moving out and how much. All right. Um, the next thing that you want to look at is up and down. All right, which again we've, we've talked about, but that also depends on the length of the fingers and the black and white key orientation. All right. Something that's very important to understand about up and down. All right, um, is that height comes from the fingers, not from the wrist. All right. So we don't want to achieve any sort of height by lifting the wrist. I can, now here's something to understand. I can, and let me drop my fall board for this to show you. I can sit on my fingertips and passively roll forward on them, all right? Passively, all right? Now I don't need to do anywhere near that much passive rolling. I can do just a little bit like that, all right? That is not the same thing as pulling my fingertips in, all right? I'm rolling up on that, and that first joint might bend a little bit, and that's okay to do because I'm not actively pulling in and engaging that long flexor, all right? I'm passively rolling forward to, do, to get my in, my out, whatever I need to, or rolling backward, all right? So that's something that's important to... Uh, to distinguish between that, that we get that height from the fingers, and if I'm playing low versus high, all right, that's the height, that's the height range that I have to work with, all right. Any higher than that, I have to start breaking my wrist, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to break the alignment rather at the wrist. I want to keep that. So any height that I need, any height difference that I need needs to come from the fingers, either dropping more down out of the hand, again, to where it's not an extreme range, we don't want to pull them down out of the hand, but if they're dropping down versus dropping more out of the hand, being more forward of the hand, and that's what gives us our height change, all right? And that's important to understand, because a lot of times I see people talking about height, and it, and they're, you know, they're talking about pulling up at the wrist, you know? Or, or pushing forward at the arm, you know? Um, and of course, those are, those are extreme examples of that, you know? Um, but I truly do believe the most efficient place to gain height is from changing the height of the fingers, or changing the height of the arm, rather, by changing the mm, direction of the fingers, let's say. All right, so looking again at just a C major scale, all right? Oftentimes, people think that if you're going out, you're also going down, all right? And sometimes that's the case. Out and down is, is commonly, they're commonly placed together. But you also have to look at the length of the fingers. So showing you from this side, or showing you this hand from this side, all right? When I go out to two, I'm actually going to come up slightly. Right, rather than going down, because I need to start building height so that when I go to my three, I'm going in and up to three as well. So that's two outs, one associated with it, or 
sorry, that's two ups. One is associated with an out motion. The other is associated with an in motion. So my arm is going up, up. So I'm gaining height in my fingers. And that height is going to help me when it comes time to pick up and rotate my arm across, rotate my finger rather, and bring my arm across. All right. If I don't have that height, if I just go out, in, and then I pick up my thumb, it's a lot harder to make that, you kind of hear, I kind of crash down in that, but if I get that height, all right, and then I'm rotating it again, I'm in that. So playing the C major scale, using those ins and outs, I'm going to start down, up, up, then I'm going to go down to the thumb, up, 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 and then again, whether I'm going to five or whether I'm going to one, I'm going to go down, all right? So regardless, and if I go to one, I'm going to restart, restart the up and down cycle. So that in and out combined with the up and down, all right, is very, it's very useful in terms of um, getting the arm moving and, and, and not just rotating. Here's my C major scale if I just rotate. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't play, all right? Rotation, again, it's a great motion, but it doesn't play by itself. If I, if I incorporate that, if I incorporate that up and down and that in and out, it happens wonderfully for me. All right. Um, I posted in uh, yesterday, when I, when I posted the link again, I posted a PDF of some examples. We probably won't have time to get to all of them today, but I, I wanted to pull some stuff from the teaching literature and just kind of put it in a more practical sense. Um, so now we'll go through some examples, and I see some questions coming through the chat. Um, feel free to keep asking them in there, and I will pull them up at the, at once, once I'm done and answer any questions, and also if you just want to save a question and ask it verb, uh, ask it, you know, on the audio at the end, that's also perfectly fine. But either way is fine. Writing in the chat or asking it um, at the end, um, and I'll go through and, and, and answer those questions. All right. So the first example that um, I'm pulling from, and of course I, I took the time to write down the measures for everybody else, but not for myself, um, is in the uh, Kulau Sonatina, Opus 55, Number One in the first movement measures 9 through 11. And actually, we're going to look at the left hand here, but we'll try just looking at it through the, uh, through the right hand camera. So people are going to look at this situation, especially in measure 9, and say, OK, this is a good example of a rotation passage. They're going to say, but there's a problem with that. And the problem is this. When I'm rotating, that, that first measure is fine for rotation. That's just left, right, left, right, or right, left, right, left. Um, no, I was right the first time. It's left, right, left, right. Um, but once I get into the next three measures, uh, really 10, 11, and 12, I run into the problem of the interval alternating with the single note. And if you recall from the rotation lecture, intervals rotate towards the thumb. And of course, the thumb playing the single note has to rotate towards the thumb. So that means this is not a, situ a situation where it's a single rotation, where it's left, right, left, right, left, right. It's going to be right, 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 right. So again, while that is a true statement, while the, a double rotation has to happen there, I don't think any of us wants to sit there and listen to our students or anyone else's students um, in, a, in an adjudicating situation uh, play like that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that that's the sound that we, that we want to hear. So in a passage like this, it's actually far more, e uh, far more beneficial to think of those as alternating downs and ups. So you have down to the interval and then up to the single note, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And again, you can see it's a very slight motion. If I exaggerate it, I can't do it fast, but that's the motion, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and the faster I go, all right? 
but that allows for that passage to come out nice and clean. Ah, let's see. All right, so that, that allows for that, allows for you to get good, good clean sound and good clean alternating notes rather than thinking of the rotation there. Because that's going to give you, A, if you're, if you're thinking of rotation wrongly there, uh, you're going to get terrible splits in your notes. And if you're, even if you're thinking of rotation correctly, it's going to give you a very heavy sound there. So instead, you want to think about the, the down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Let's see, I'm totally, I, once, you, once you get doing, here's the thing that's fun about these motions. Once you get them and you're able to do them, you want to keep doing them because it, you, could just, you could just go on for days doing them because they're so easy and they feel so great, um, you know. And so for your sakes, I will move on, all right? Um, and it's the, same, it's the same piece, the same movement, um, and, except now we're down in measures uh, 27 and 28. Well, 27 to the downbeat of 29, all right? And this is, this is a passage. This is a sonatina I teach often enough that I, I kind of, this, th my mind went to this because I, I think of the spots where students have trouble commonly. So this is a place where they have, where, they, where I often see a lot of problems of, you know, fingering, you know, they, 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 they just can never get it right for some reason, all right? Um, so a, a lot of times when we, when we get to, and let me show you this from above. Nope, not security, wrong thing. Let me show you this from above. So when we have passages like this, a lot of times students think like this. They just kind of roll over. All right, so the first thing that I would recommend you do is work out the rotation. Let's see, and I'm already putting in the motions, the other motions, so uh, can't talk and play at the same time today. So I would work out that rotation. I would spend time working out that rotation, but then I would really hone in on the in and the out. So I'm going to show you this one from above. So I'm going to be in on my thumb. I'm going to be at least thinking of my thumb as in. Again, my thumb is playing almost as far out on the key as it can, but that is okay. Then I'm going to think out, out. Then I'm in to my five, in, in, out, in, 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 <laughs> in. got a very, um, as, ba as bad as that score looks, if you're looking at the PDF that I made, um, mine looks even worse because I've got it all marked up. All right. Um, so in, in, out, out, in, 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 out, in, 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 out, out, in, out. And there's a series of like, what, five ins there in, and that, that, from that two, in, 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 out, out, in. And again, some of those ends, it's not necessarily a, a, a terribly active moving of the arm inward. It's more of thinking of the arm moving, um, of, of the arm staying in rather than moving in, if that makes sense. All right, then I'm going to show you from the side, I'm going to show you the up and down of that passage. All right, so we're going to start down. And we're going to stay down as we move across. All right. Maybe a slight change in, in, in height, but I'm staying down. Then I start to move up, up, because I'm going from short finger to tall finger to tall finger on a black key. Then down, up, up, down. Uh, let's see. Now, here, here's if, I, if this was where the passage was ending, I'd go, and that's what I almost did a second ago, down, down, but it doesn't. I have to get across this three on B flat. So I'm going to go, instead of going down, down, again, this is a situation where context is key, up, 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 then I go across, down. And again, that height helps the ease of the rotation across. All right? Then down, down, up, down. All right? So that's those motions combined for that passage right there. Um, I have one more passage from that, but I think we'll go ahead and skip that one for time's sake. Um, let's go to the, um, this, 
there's this lovely piece, um, and I, I hope he doesn't mind me using it. I, I only put an excerpt there uh, for you all. Um, but this, this, if you've never taught this piece by uh, George Peter Tingley, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous piece for introducing uh, lyrical playing, or not necessarily introducing, but helping a student uh, develop their lyrical playing further um, at kind of that, mm, I, think, I think it's tagged as an early intermediate, but some, somewhere in there, late elementary, early intermediate student. Um, and it also has some great moments for practicing in and out and up and down. So the first thing I'm going to actually show you from above, the first thing that this opening needs, and uh, let's see, I didn't put my, I didn't put myself correctly. So you, let's see, I guess next best thing is a full body view. So the first thing I need to do to start this is this. All right, I don't know if you saw what I did there. All right, I move, I have to shift to the right to make this work. There's, no, there's nothing that calls me being centered on the keys. And actually, to make the fingering and the motions work, I need to be slightly to the right. Now, here's where that, ana that anatomical knowledge comes in very useful. Because I'm not just going to move right. If I just move right, even just this little bit, I feel extremely unbalanced on the, key on the bench. All right? Maybe not extremely. I feel unbalanced on the bench. All right? So I'm going to move back slightly. I'm going to move, rock back on my sits bones slightly. All right, I'm exaggerating a little bit so you can see it. So I'm back slightly and then to the right. And I feel a lot more comfortable. Now I'll show you what that looks like in overhead. Once my arms are in position, I'm here and I'm set up to do this, okay? So that, this, is, this is with me shifted. So I'm going to start with with uh, this little theme here, right there, all right? So first of all, I, I, I came up with the motion, I, I used the motions using the fingering that was in there. The reason I did that is I, I would actually, I actually, when I teach this, I use a different fingering there, and I'll tell you that in just a minute. But um, sometimes kids are going to have to be able to do this. They're going to have to be able to do, if, for example, if they're playing a C minor scale they're going to have to be able to use that fingering. So, so these motions are going to be necessary at some point. All right. So I start, again, I'm, think, I'm playing the thumb in almost exactly the same spot every time you'll notice. But I'm thinking, it's about how I'm thinking about it. So I'm thinking of my thumb as being out. Then I'm going to go in, out. All right. So again, if, if I just, if I don't move, actually move in, that's probably best. But if I think, if I stay, but I have to think a slightly in, maybe more up, all right, then out, in, in, out, out. All right, so this is out, in, out, in, in, out, out. All right, and in speed, we're going we're gonna to get, all right. And then the left hand part is a great example. This is a good place to practice what we were just talking about in the kulau with those. Um, all right, this is a nice slow. Of course, it's this is. Uh, sorry, no, this is not. Never mind. <laughs> Ignore what I just said because this is totally the opposite. Our single note, we're going to be able to rotate towards the five because it's because the the, the interval includes the thumb. So these are these are going to all be single rotations. So scratch what I just said. All right, let's just discuss it in terms of down and up. This is a good place to practice that down up concept. All right, so you have a down. Oh, well, it's kind of impossible to see it from above, isn't it? Let me switch to this camera. All right, so I have a, I'm, I'm starting down on a short finger. And even though my thumb is a short finger, it's playing with my three. So my thumb has to come and play. Again, this is that idea of the thumb has a range that it can play on before the wrist becomes involved. So I'm playing up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, all right? And we'll talk again, we'll talk more about this next time, but I'm actually getting a sound that I want there as well. Um, and it's related to the motion, um, but it, 
they're not always tied together. So we'll, we'll get into more detail about that. But I'm getting this down, up, and associated with that up is an in. I'm going, I'm out and down, in and up. In and up. Out and down, in and up. In and up, down and out. In and up, out and down. In and up, out and down. And it, and it goes on like that. Sorry, I'm, I'm playing more than you have. But um, so then you get this whole passage of, let's see. Um, incidentally, that other fingering that I would use there is I would do one, two, one, two, three, four, three, in, in case you're wondering. Um, but it doesn't change a whole lot about the motion. It's still in, or out, in, out, in. Well, that, that too is going to be out, then in, in, out. So it does change some of the motion, but um, it's, yeah, I, it, it, like I say, kids need to be able to do that fingering at some point. So it's, it's not a bad thing for them to learn. Um, again, there's another passage that I wanted to use from this, but for time's sake, we will move on. Um, here is one of my favorite teaching pieces. Uh, it's, a, it's a great first Tarantella, if you don't have a, a, a first Tarantella to teach. This is in the, um, uh, the Faber and Faber Piano Literature Book One um, series, and it's this. It's 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 a fun piece. Kids love it. Of course, kids love it. A lot of times, love anything fast. Okay, so we're going to talk about this in terms of a few things, uh, measures one through four, and um, we're going to start just kind of on the scalar stuff on this. All right. Now, the motion on this, this is actually a great place. If you're looking for a piece to maybe start introducing the concept of in and out, this is actually a great one to start with um, because it's, it, it's a very repetitive motion. And it start, it just the idea is we want to just start getting our students' arms moving. At some point, we just have to get them moving. And then we, we start adding it and making it more complicated. But this, this one is, is actually quite simple a lot of times. So this is going to start, starting on the F in measure, well, it's in measure one, but starting on the F in measure one, we have the three starts out, and we move in, in, then we come out, in, in, out, in, in, out, in, in, out, in, in. Sorry, I totally played the wrong fingering there. Out, in, in, 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 out, out. So there at the end, that, and that's fun, uh, not fun, but it's uh, a challenge as far as the motion is concerned because right there at the end, we have out, in, 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 out, out. So they have to, um, they have to kind of think. They have to not get too locked into it um, and remember that they have three ins in a row at the end and then they end it with two outs. So in slow motion, we have out, in, in, and let me show you this from above, actually, and then we'll talk about the up and down that you're probably seeing. All right, so we have out, in, in, 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 out, or in, sorry, out, out. See, you've got you've to keep on, keep on yourself about that as well. All right, and, and, and quickly... All right, that's what it looks like in speed. So it's, it can't be, again, it can't be this huge motion, otherwise they're gonna, but, but they, can, they can start thinking of it big. And then you say, okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna do just a little bit of that. Then, because they can do that, and then you start connecting it. All right. Um, then let's talk about the ups of this. The ups and the downs, all right? So what's nice about this is the downs line up with the beats and the ups line up with the off beats, which is fantastic for our sound. So we have, we're going to have down with our out, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, down, up, up. Then we have down, up, up. So our outs are going to be up as well. Down, up, up, all right? So we have, in slow motion, we have down, up, up, down, up, up down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up. All right? Now, um, let's see. Oh, I know what I was going to talk about. 
So there's another very important thing, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this fast, and I want you to see if you can spot. There's another very important motion that we've talked about, another very important thing that happens um, between these sets. Of course, it's happening between all of the notes. You probably know what it is, all right? But it's particularly, you see it between the sets of outs, out, out in ins and down up ups, all right? So here we go. Well, let's see, I didn't do it at all. <laughs> and I don't know why I'm not getting that one. There we go, all right? Um, so we have, between each of these sets, we have what we, remember last week, or last month, we talked about active and automatic rotation, where you have that really, that, that big, that big throw across. So you don't want it to be just kind of a, a, a small thing, you want to have an actual um, momentum builder there. So da 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 da. And what that does is that accomplishes your out and down because if you're moving in and up, then you've got to get out and down quickly. So that active actually helps throw you back very quickly. So da 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 da. Then we get. And kids can play it fast once they get the motions, and they love it. What, you know, what kid do you know that just doesn't love to be able to play something fast? Um, so I, I think I was maybe a little enthusiastic in my selection of examples for today. Um, I want to honor your time. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to address the questions from the chat first, but then uh, if anybody else has a question, um, I'm happy to answer. Let's see. Um, so, is there a good way to explain or help a student change from the cross under and crossover technique on the octave scale? Is that why you introduce the height? Uh, that is one of the reasons that I introduce the height. The best thing you can do when you're, when you're working on the scales is um, convince your students, A, <laughs> this is the part that I think we all have trouble with, but we have to first convince our students to go slow. <laughs> Fun, right? Um, and then we have to get them comfortable with the idea that they aren't, for a little bit when they're going slow, they aren't going to hear the E and the F connect. They're going to, you know. Now, what we don't want, and let me actually show this in the closer up camera. What we don't want is for the students to pull out of the key like this and hop over to the F. That's not rotation. Uh, this is a problem that a lot of students have. Uh, we have to tell them to stay anchored in that note while they lift. They have to stay anchored in that note. And then, again, like all the other motions, they're going to release as they drop across. All right, so there's going to be a separation for right now. And then, yes, I start, so then I start talking with them about the, the height and the in and the out, all right? And so then I start introducing that height. And as they get those things in the right, purport, in the right proportion, well, let me sit and face the piano and try that again. All right? Um, that gives them that, that ability to move across without crossing the thumb under. And as we talked about last time, um, we do have that, that idea that uh, Sheila talks about of the thmunder, the, the, thumb, the thumb passively moving slightly under the hand. It's very, it's, it's, it's like I say, I, I, I even kind of waffle on uh, whether or not, you know, when, sometimes it feels like it does, sometimes it feels like it does not. Um, so, so it really is one of those things where it's, if you don't think about it, if you don't worry about it, then it, it, it doesn't really present a problem. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that answered your question. Um, let's see, is there anybody else either in the, in the chat or on here that, um, that has a question about anything that I uh, said or needs some clarification on anything? Um, anything at all? If not, um, I can go ahead, I, I can, I can, well, let's see, I think I said this, set it till um, 3.30, but um, 
like I say, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know Beth, it's a lot I of had a question. Yes. Uh huh. So maybe this is just me, but in the number two example of the Kulau Sonatina, uh huh. Your example in the right hand was to go out on the one, two, three, the G, the B, the D to go out, which right. was the opposite of my natural inclination. My inclination was to go in. Right. I can see why my inclination was wrong. But then how do you know, like, what, what really is the best way to do it? Um, so a, a lot of trial and error in, in some cases. Um, it, again, it, it, it's a con contextual sort of thing. If I, for example, if I were playing just, if, if I were not returning down, so let's see, let's get there. So if I were not returning down, tur or turning around at the top of it and doing that, I would, if it was just that sort of thing, I would probably move, move more across like that, actually. Um, but because I'm having to, if I, if I move all the way in here and I'm coming, it, it's because of what's coming up I have to, that I look at, where, where four is stuck now, four is not gonna be comfortable playing in there because I've walked everything in so when I start with those, or when I get those outs, then I get my fingers, and I guess I should show this in the overhead camera. Um, I get my fingers out of, the, out of the black key area, and then I'm able to move, let's see, I lost my spot. There we go. And now my four is, it's just outside of the black key area, but it's outside of there, and it's in a place where it can comfortably play. So it, it really is looking at the passage as a whole, and sometimes when we look, and, and I know that you know this, and, and probably every single one of us in here knows this, um, sometimes when we look at a passage, uh, or at a problem, rather, for a student, we have to, we see, we see the result of the problem, but we don't see the problem itself. And so we have to kind of analyze what's happening around it, and say, okay, and, and it's the same sort of situation here. I have to look at what's coming up. If I was playing a passage of just, then I probably would just go in like that. Um, but because of what comes after it, I change what, I, and I, I hope that makes sense and helps with that. Um, let's see. Um, what stage do you start with these in and out and up and down ideas? I, I um, or not what stage, what age. Uh, I don't really have a particular age. The, the thing is, is that we can, we, we, are, we are, as piano teachers, we're very clever people. Oftentimes, we are teaching our kids things that they don't know that they're learning, okay? So I do a lot of, uh, and I, I neglected to mention this today. I mentioned it um, in the rotation lecture, but I, I neglected to mention. I do a lot of demonstration for my, for my little littles. Uh, a lot of just showing and say, hey, can you try doing it like me? So I don't tell them, I don't even, I don't even ask them to, to notice, do you see my arm moving in or out or up or down? I just say, try, try, try doing it like me, you know? And, and, and they normally catch on pretty quickly. So I, I give them the concept without telling them what they're doing a lot of times, especially for the, for the little ones, because I want them doing this from, from the very beginning. So even when I start them on those initial pentascales that, that we work on, you know, I have them working, working with picking up and dropping and, and, and okay, you're going to move, you're going to, you, you know, again, you're going to demonstrate for them moving their arm out. And sometimes I come, come alongside when I'm teaching in person, when I'm teaching virtually, you know, sometimes you just have to come out and say, you know, well, move, move your arm out just a little bit or like that. But, but they can understand the, the ideas. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's more about knowing more information than you're planning on giving them. Uh, that's really, that's, that's my biggest piece of advice is you have to, you have to have the information in such great detail that you can sort out the overall picture for them and say, and, and pull them in, you know, because they, they aren't going to oftentimes, um, when they're, you know, 
five and six years old, I want them moving their arm, but they don't need a whole bunch of illustrations. They just need to see the arm moving in and out, up and down. That's, that's my take on it, at least, you know. Um, as they're even seven, eight, nine, you know, to me, that's an age where they're starting to, to develop better reasoning skills, and, and if they aren't, then I'm going to help them <laughs> develop better reasoning skills. Um, so I start talking through and using examples like the stairs and walking and stuff like that, because they can understand. Kids, kids are, 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 are pretty smart. Um, so yeah, sorry, that, that, that was probably a little more rambly than you wanted, but hopefully that helps. So I, I, I teach the concepts to all ages, but I introduce it differently depending on how, how, how much information I think they can take in. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, is there anyone wanting to unmute and ask a question? Are we, are we good to go? All right. Um, if you uh, feel the need to reach out and ask any questions, uh, please feel free to. If any arise after this that you thought, oh, you know, he said that. I wonder what he meant by that or, or anything like that. Um, but I, I hope that this was a useful session to you. I'm going to stop the recording now.